thank you so much uh, for uh, including this part of this symposium to CRF, ABC, and, and everybody here. And it's amazing to see all the women out there. I love it. It's very comforting. But uh, but these are these are my other folks, the clot busting team. And so we'll go from bleeding now to thromboembolic disease, where um, this is a really important uh, issue around the country, worldwide, um, but also specifically for many underserved populations, women um, and men alike. And so what I hope to do in this short time, because I was also warned about the length of the talk, and I will talk very quickly um, so that you get to hear these other experts, but uh, to try and highlight what we, uh, really some of the diagnostics for acute pulmonary embolism, how to work up the patient, recognize when it may actually represent chronic disease, and what are some of the novel therapeutics that are currently really evolving almost on a, a yearly basis that we can um, that we can give to these patients and offer them. But first, some sobering facts in the in sort of the spirit of this session today, obviously, and this group is that uh, venous thromboembolism incidence rates are much higher in the um, Black American population than in whites. And in fact, there's more hospitalizations or the rates are rising in the black American population as opposed to uh, white population where it has declined over the past decade. So there's a real um, area of need here. Um, flipping that over to the women, uh, we know that acute PE is one of the greatest uh, killers or risk factors in pregnancy for women. And so this is a real issue for those of you taking care of um, pregnant women, of course, as well. So I'm really going to, go through a case to just highlight sort of the practical approach that we have, starting with uh, acute PE and recognizing it. So in this woman, a 53-year-old woman, African-American woman with systemic hypertension, presents to an outside hospital with progressive shortness of breath, exercise tolerance uh, was diminished, and worsening shortness of breath for about three days. The CTA was sent from the emergency room. You can see it in the top panel there. It's not subtle. There's a very large saddle pulmonary embolism and enlarged right heart, which you don't see there. Um, had also lower extremity DVTs and was transferred in and billed as having a submassive pulmonary embolism. Um, this patient had described having on and off pedal edema from previous DVTs several years ago, but had no previous history of pulmonary embolism, um, had a history of fibroids, and had an aunt who had uh, lower extremity DVTs. And this is very classic of what we will see on a fairly regular basis. So the next steps may be obvious. You, you, um, you know, do the usual workup, getting labs, perhaps an echo, imaging. Um, but I want to sort of really um, make this a strong point of this presentation is that we all, and hopefully um, also can emphasize this, ask about chronicity of dyspnea. So, this is so important, particularly as interventional cardiologists and anyone taking care of a patient with an acute PE, is to ask how long, how long have you had shortness of breath? Um, and you know, up at Columbia and I'm sure many other programs, we've sort of created systems around an acute PE team and a chronic, uh, you know, pulmonary embolism team, and then there's a lot of gray zone in between. But truly strategizing in making sure that a patient who comes in with acute shortness of breath, uh, we're not missing the chronicity of the disease and that they may have had recurrent PEs and this is a sentinel event because the treatment strategies are quite different. And so, you know, we have great novel treatment strategies for acute PE and even for chronic PE, but we really need to distinguish them at the forefront. Um, and so this patient just uh, jumping down only had a couple of days of shortness of breath, long flight, and said that prior to that, absolutely swore, you know, her breathing was fine. So we get our PERT, acute PE team who, you know, this is Phil Green's uh, baby. Uh, uh, I call Phil and say, we got a, we got a problem. So, um, or he calls me. But um, anyway, bedside echo shows a normal LV, but a dilated and depressed uh, right ventricle. And then you look at all the possible treatment plans now for an acute PE. First of all, confirming, is it really acute? Um, looking at advanced hemodynamic support if the patient is unstable. Um, do they need an embolectomy if they're really unstable? Systemic thrombolytics, catheter-directed thrombolytics, interventional thromb thrombectomy, and or anticoagulation alone. And so how do you determine what is the proper treatment plan? Well, this is a nice algorithm. It's a little busy, but really to jump to the important points, uh, we use this essentially 
uh, on the green left panel, that's green is good. You know, you'll have a low risk PE. There's not no real hemodynamic compromise, and the patient can be hopefully safely anticoagulated and go home. Over in the red, uh, these are high risk patients. They're not stable. Their blood pressure is low. They're on pressors. Um, you know, you've got your teams, including surgical teams, on uh, lookout. Possibly, you have to do surgery and bolectomy. These days, sometimes we stabilize patients on ECMO before they'll go to the OR or use it and uh, as they recover. Um, systemic thrombolytics, I can say we use it very rarely, um, and we can talk about that later, but it's really unusual that we use those these days. And then we've got the patients in yellow in the middle. So the submassive PE, the patient like I presented, uh, perhaps has marked RV dysfunction, markers of elevated proponin or BNP, and um, you know, they're hemodynamically stable, but they're kind of higher risk because they've got these biomarkers that are abnormal. And that's where the group, you know, the team collaboration comes in and deciding what to do with these patients. I mean, if they stabilize, they can go to the low risk category, but these patients who are kind of in the higher risk uh, submassive category have a, a host of treatment options available to them now um, that uh, take, again, a team approach in deciding what is appropriate or what may not be appropriate and how to use them. And so I'm gonna briefly run through a couple of them. Again, our team here is, uh, you know, Phil and Ajay are, are experts in doing these uh, procedures, so, so they can speak to them afterwards. But the catheter-directed therapies, whether it's using, um, you know, putting in the catheters and leaving them in overnight, per se, with directed uh, thrombolytics with or without ultrasound is one approach that we might use for this patient in this scenario. Um, there are now, uh, low retrievers, or you can do, you know, interventional thromb thrombectomy uh, here in a particular case, if they're either too high risk for surgery, they have something that is migrating, you know, rapidly. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this in a moment, but this is another possibility for, per, uh, for certain patients. Um, and actually, we always get photos at the end of the case, because it's always super impressive. And, and uh, you, you actually don't know how the patient was walking around with this, this uh, blocking their lungs so, circulation. So it's Pretty amazing stuff. Um, so, but I go back to the case, and this could have been very different. I could have said to the patient, "Hey, you know, how, when did your shortness of breath start?" And they may have said, "Well, um, you know, it was it was a couple of years ago, or a few months ago, after uh, a long flight, and that uh, the breathing was fine until this happened." But you know, this is not a patient you want to take to the cath lab and start necessarily busting open clots and pulling them out because you're gonna ultimately hit cement, which is distal to that and the chronic clots, and they won't necessarily make them better. And so you really need to have on the radar whether when the clots have not uh, completely resolved and been chronic. And I just, again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but um, roughly uh, three to four percent of acute PEs go on to develop uh, chronicity or chronic clots. These are hardened, um, you know, clots that are in the lungs that are not going to dissolve with any thrombolytic you give. Um, the signs and symptoms are similar to a PE, but over a longer duration of time. And again, asking when these symptoms started is really critical. This is often mistaken for other medical problems. And again, if these are patients, uh, particularly who have poor access to healthcare, they're often mistaken and misdiagnosed and, and sitting in the wings for quite some time before we see them, particularly with chronic disease. Um, there may be patients who've had an acute PE, and then never had follow-up after that. And we're starting to bridge the gap, I, I hope we are, in making sure that every one of our patients who had at least a submassive PE is followed, you know, again, at least at three months to make sure that that dyspnea is gone because those patients are a real risk. And that's where we can do better in the community. Um, not going to go through the entire diagnostic workup, but this is pretty clear cut that this patient has problems. Uh, the right atrium is huge. PR jet is up, left ventricle is squashed. Um, what I do want to highlight is that a VQ scan is actually the most sensitive test for chronic thromboembolic pH, and a lot of people don't realize that. And uh, radiologists call us and say, why are you ordering this? But you can see these wedge-shaped defects that are, um, you know, again, you could miss on a CTA. So I get calls all the time, CTA was normal, but this suspicion is there do the VQ or go to the cath lab and get selective angios if that's, uh, if that's something that you can do. A CTA is still very important and you can highlight or find any other pathology in the lungs. So, um, and using these novel techniques, there's dual energy CT, 
Uh, it's also going to help showing perfusion deficits. Uh, we are, you know, getting better and better at reading these, and I think one day maybe we'll be able to replace the VQ, but not at the current uh, moment. So uh, the catheterization is obviously very important to confirm the disease. Patient has pH. You want to make sure it fits their burden that what, of what you think you've seen on the uh, non-invasive imaging, and then we do a selective PA angios to really confirm where the disease is. You can see these pinched out lesions. Uh, this can come in many shapes or sizes. Um, but uh, but ultimately is the roadmap for the surgeon. If this patient uh, is a surgical candidate, these patients can actually have, I'm going to go right to it, a surgery to remove the clots, and that's called a thromboendarterectomy. Um, again, not done, not for everybody, but certain trained uh, CT surgeons that have gotten very adept at it, you can see, uh, get all the way into the distal branches, and it is the treatment of choice for operable chronic thromboembolic pH. However, um, there's also one medication that's been FDA approved, and that's Riosagut, and that was uh, shown to improve exercise capacity and WHO functional class and hemodynamics if patients are not operable. If they're operable, get them to the OR. That's, that's, the, that's sort of the key point I want you to take home. But if they're not, or if they have residual pulmonary hypertension after their surgery, this is one of the medications that we could treat them with. And it's a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator, so it works in the nitric oxide pathway. Something novel that Ajay Kurtne has been uh, really pioneering with us up at Columbia is balloon pulmonary angioplasty. So this um, was actually pioneered, I think, in, in, in Japan, where they did not have some of the surgical expertise we had here in the US and in Europe. And uh, what you can see is actually putting wires and balloons through to dilate up occluded vessels. And, to me, originally, it sounded quite barbaric that you'd just be squashing the clot up against the wall, and how is that going to help? Um, but actually, with time, I, you've gotten pretty good at this, Ajay. <laughs> so um, this was the first study that showed it, and uh, actually, it was a pediatric cardiologist that, that did this very that uh, procedure first because they're used to distal piece, PA stenoses. But these are some of the lesions you can see, and there are certain ones that are more amenable to ballooning, like the web lesions. Um, and so we've been growing for patients who are not a surgical candidate or some patients who rethrombose even after they've had surgery and are not a surgical candidate, um, we've been basically, um, you know, growing this, this uh, area up at Columbia. And this is one case. This is one of Ajay's cases where you can see there's no flow there. I'm just going to run through it very quickly. He finds a way to put a wire through. There is a balloon there somewhere, um, but I'm going to just sort of jump to the chase. This is after the ballooning and after the dilation about a month later, this woman had uh, flow restored to the right lower lobe. This is typically done in stages, not one sitting. Um, and we're still sort of, uh, the jury's sort of still deliberating on what the best approach to do this is and how many sittings. But it's a novel technique, a novel approach that we're using in conjunction with our medical and surgical uh, treatments. So back to our patient. Um, this patient, yes, she did have chronic disease, um, but I also mentioned she had a history of fibroids, and it, I just want to high, highlight again in the in the spirit of this session that uh, this was a work that we presented a couple of years ago. Actually, I need to write it up, um, but that women with fibroids, women with, uh, we've had a series of women, and actually what you can see here is that all but one were African American uh, with massive fibroids who had venous stasis and developed. Um, chronic thromboembolic pH. And so we actually, uh, they were too sick to have a hysterectomy or fibroidectomy because of the, the pulmonary hypertension. So we bridged them, um, actually still put in filters so that during their surgery or after their surgery, they wouldn't thrombose again uh, because of this obstruction, but um, essentially sent them for a pulmonary thromboendarterectomy and shortly thereafter, uh, more than half of them did end up having hysterectomy, and uh, they all actually feel like a million bucks because of, you know, they, they couldn't breathe before. But it's not actually in the guidelines for a uh, risk factor for CTEF, but now more recently it has been placed in there. And I think anyone taking care of women, particularly um, African American women at risk for fibroids, should keep this in mind if they have dyspnea of unknown uh, etiology. So I'm going to leave it there and. Uh, with some pearls here to take home. Uh, there's a lot of treatment strategies emerging. Recognize the difference between acute and chronic. Follow up 
uh, patients, women and men, who've had acute PE to make sure you don't miss chronic uh, PE. We have, again, a lot of tools now in our armamentarium to treat them, and also women who happen to be at risk with uh, massive fibroids, too, if they have DVT or shortness of breath, please keep that in mind as well. So thank you. I'm going to start off. Um, so pregnant woman, acute PE, how do you decide when to do go in and do a catheter treatment? And so I'm going to start with you. Uh, uh, thank you. You know, uh, being, a, being a cardiologist who started focusing uh, in my earlier in my career on actually frailty and care for older adults, when Ajay assigned me the pulmonary embolism responsibility when I joined faculty, uh, it was the, the, some of the scariest patients were those young pregnant patients with PE. And the honestly, the first principle is that I try to treat them like any other patient. And you would just, you know, you can't take care of the baby if you don't take care of the mom. I didn't make that up. I just, um, <laughs> I just l learned that from my mentors. But, uh, and I, and, and honestly, we risk stratify them uh, the same way that we risk stratify uh, any other patient with uh, submassive or a massive PE. Massive PE are, is the scariest, but in some ways uh, it's the most straightforward because you know if there's truly a massive PE, the patient is, is going to die probably that day or within hours. So we, um, we tend to, inst if, if we have to, we give systemic lytics. We haven't had to do that, uh, but we tend to institute uh, ECMO uh, as soon as possible. Uh, once the patient is on ECMO, uh, there's, there's, a, there's time to take a step back and you know, think, make sure that they're responding to anticoagulation, that they didn't have an acute complication uh, from ECMO implantation. And then, and then we, tried, we, we try as a group to understand what are their likelihood of coming off ECMO just on anticoagulation alone, or if they need something adjunctive. And uh, in, in one pretty uh, amazing case, we, we, took, uh, we, we did ECMO and then catheter-directed thrombolytics on a woman who was uh, 10 weeks pregnant and my, uh, my, my team can tell you that she's still my favorite patient. She brings her baby to see us. Um, so we've had uh, some amazing success stories, uh, you know, with this approach. But basically any therapy that we would use in a patient, in a non-pregnant patient, we would use a pregnant patient. Thank you. And so a couple of times in the presentation, we heard how high risk African-Americans are overall. And we understand, right, the risk related to women. So you've got a program that but when they get to your door, all the boxes are getting checked appropriately. What happens prior to that? And how do you, how are you, right, pretty novel treatments? How is it getting out to the physicians who treat patients in these communities? What are the activities that you guys are taking on beyond what you're doing um, in, from an interventional perspective, besides coming to newbeat.org, to really, to really um, have those uh, events, uh, something that people know that, yes, there are treatments, yes, there are options, here are sites, um, so you address access. What do you guys do about it? Ajay, I'll start with you on that. I think, um, you know, I'm sure Eric and Jen can speak um, well to this, but, you know, it's, it's actually pretty remarkable that if you think about how there are many effective therapies for um, VTE now, particularly medications, but yet the disease is also a chronic disease. So it used to be that if you had a provoked DVT, you only needed to be on anticoagulation for a short period of time. But it turns out that more and more patients really need to be on lifelong therapy. And some of the things that mentioned in the first session about access to medications, access to payers and that sort of thing are really, really relevant in underrepresented communities. So for instance, if you prescribe a medicine like a NOAC, someone sees an ad on TV saying Xarelto kills people or call me at this 1-800 number, um, <laughs> and then they're not going to see you for a while because of diminished access to care, they come off anticoagulation and then they're really at risk for some of these recurrent events. Um, compound that with the educational issue, and it's amazing because there are some really good role models um, for this disease. Serena Williams comes to mind, 
um, Chris Bosh, other you know NBA players who've had VTE and it's particularly chronic, but yet you don't see those stories keep coming about emphasizing these things. So one of the things programmatically that we've done, and Erica spoke to this, is that if somebody comes in with a PE, they're set up for follow-up and they have to have regular follow-up to ensure that they got out of that first event, but they're gonna be maintained on any coagulation so the second and third events don't actually occur. Obviously, we can do a lot more than that, and there's perhaps other outreach that can be done, but I view this as a really, really um, underserved area. The AHA champions heart disease awareness and that sort of thing. I don't know of very effective you know, awareness campaigns for chronic thromboembolic disease. Really, Philip, as we sit here today and the topics we're addressing, this is a really big gap, no question. So, you know, a number of you, Jennifer, you guys got really excited about Coumadin when it was discussed just now. The, the rat poison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really sad that that's what it is. And so it's for exciting. the chronic management of each, Coumadin gets used. I think you would, frankly, if I remember, you were the only people in the room to raise your hand using Coumadin. So when are you using it? What do you want to tell the rest of us about, hey, here's why it's still a wonderful, I think it's like a, what is it, five cents now um, as a medication, and here's how it's used. Well, I, I will mention um, one quick, quick thing before I start, which is that I think what's so important to talk about here is that I take care of a, a lot of the pregnant women with heart disease at Columbia, and that, you know, um, minorities are really dying of um, pregnancy related complications at a much higher rate than. Caucasian um, Americans, and it's really kind of sad and deplorable how um, high our maternal mortality rates are. And I think that there's finally a lot of attention being paid to this, and there's been a big ProPublica um, campaign to highlight all of the maternal deaths. And actually now um, I sit on this New York State Department of Health Maternal Mortality Review Board where we go through and look at all the women in New York State who died, period, and try to understand why they died and how, and an overwhelming majority are uh, black Americans or Hispanic uh, Americans. And so in terms of VTE, uh, and a number of the cases are PE. So I think that obviously we know that VTE is very high risk in pregnancy and in the postpartum. And frankly, PE is higher risk in the postpartum than in the peripartum period. So it's the after pregnancy also that we need to worry about in terms of following people up for preeclampsia and PE and, and DBT. And for some strange reason, African Americans have a much higher rate of um, DVT, even though they lack all of the genes that predispose people to uh, hypercoagulability. So where there's some disconnect, right? That if white Americans have a higher rates of prothrombin gene mutations and protein D deficiency, and that that why are you know black women getting DVTs and dying? Is it because they have hyper? blood pressure? Is it that they're more obese? Is there some other genetic factor that we don't understand? And I think it's been really under-researched. In terms of Coumadin, we use it a lot because I, when in pregnancy, we don't use NOAX or DOAX. We use either heparin, Lovenox, or Coumadin. And we can use Coumadin for a lot of different reasons during pregnancy. You know, Lovenox we can use for DVT. Coumadin we use for mechanical valves. So, and it's, you know, depending on how much Coumadin you need, there's varying recommendations. So sometimes we use Coumadin um, in patients who have mechanical mitral valves that are at very high risk of stroke or have had a prior stroke, as long as their Coumadin dose is less than five milligrams. There's a feeling that higher doses of Coumadin are teratogenic. So it's sort of person by person case basis. We also, as a heart failure doctor, I work with a lot of um, of LVAD patients. So those patients all have to be on Coumadin. <laughs> and, so, and, and I seem yeah. to have inherited a lot of people on Coumadin just of other reasons. And they say, and whenever I say like, wow, you want to try this new drug? You only have to take it once a day. And you don't have to get your INR checked. And they're like, no, oh, I don't want to try that. I'm happy with mine. I, it's all fine. I get my Coumadin checked once a month and it's all good. So I think there's a lot of different reasons why people stay on Coumadin. It is a lot more work intensive for some, but it's also easier to titrate and regulate. No, no, no. I mean, CTEF. on the CTEF group, the, the chronic thromboembolic group, uh, we have had, we tried to migrate towards some of the novel agents, and we had a couple of patients rethrombose, and it just kind of scared us mm -hmm. as a program because you never want to have to take a person who's had a pulmonary thromboendorectomy surgery back to the OR. So um, we have actually just, from our experience, and a lot of my colleagues in the field, 
migrated still toward Coumadin, but we need to do the studies to decide if any of the other agents are going to be as effective. So for now, that's that's why they're cheering over there. <laughs> yeah, in, in the acute PE setting, I think um, some of the data we've seen with the direct oral anticoagulants have um, have really underlied the point that Ajay made, which is that uh, a first episode of venous thromboembolic event is usually not only indicative of an isolated uh, provoked event, but some underlying uh, hypercoagulable tendency, whether it's diagnosed with genetics or an underlying disease or just something we don't understand yet. And now with low dose uh, direct oral anticoagulants for extended therapy, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, some of the patients I take care of, young women, how long are we going to continue low dose anticoagulation? Because in them, it seems like we talked about elevated bleeding risk, but in, in young, healthy patients, it seems like you can really eat your cake and have it because the bleeding risk uh, compared to placebo in these trials is really astonish astonishingly low. So for, for the acute PE setting, unless there's another compelling reason, we tend to also, you know, almost exclusively use uh, the direct oral antibiotic.